um, called The Spiritual Work of Racial Justice, um, A Month of Meditations with Ignatius of Loyola. And I thought, what an amazing book this is. Um, I thought, I want to have the author on for the podcast. And so I contacted Patrick. Oh, thank you very much. He's right. I contacted Patrick and asked him whether he'd be willing to come on the podcast to talk uh, with me. And he very graciously did. It was a wonderful conversation um, and, and one of my favorites I've ever done. And uh, Patrick is, as you'll quickly learn, uh, an extraordinarily um, wise and well-traveled and insightful and spiritually discerning soul. So it is a pleasure uh, for me to be here with Patrick. Uh, and we'll talk more about his background here as we get into our conversation. But a couple of things you should know. Uh, he is um, a professor of what, psychology, is that right, at Creighton right. University uh, in uh, Omaha. And he is also a Jesuit. And um, he is the author of how many books? The, the, the one book I mentioned is the, we, that's the one. That was 2021. This is a more recent book, 2022, called The Crucible of Racism, subtitled Ignatian Spirituality and the Power of Hope. You have a book coming out this year, don't you? Uh, from Broadleaf. Two books. Forgive me. Two books this year uh, coming out from Broadleaf. Uh, well, uh, one of them from Broadleaf. What are the two books, Patrick? from Broadleaf, the other one from Anam Kara. Okay, all right. Um, and uh, so he's writing uh, at a better clip than a book a year, which I don't quite understand how he does that, and everything else. Uh, am I jealous? Only a little bit. Um, Just do it at night. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> all right. Um, and so what we're going to do today, here's the plan. Um, I'm going to uh, interview Patrick and put questions to him to which he responds. We'll do that for somewhere in the vicinity of 40 or so minutes, at the end of which uh, we'll open the floor for questions from you, uh, for Patrick, okay? Uh, and this is a great opportunity. I mean, Patrick's terrific. And then when we're done with the questions, he'll lead us in a meditation, all right? And that will be uh, the totality of the workshop. Does that sound okay, everybody here? All right, then let's go ahead and get started, Patrick. Um, first of all, um, I find your personal story really interesting, right? So uh, you grew up in Haiti. Uh, you have degrees from, uh, let me see, well, in universities in France and Mexico. You got your uh, doctorate from the Catholic Theolo Theological Union in Chicago, uh, and you work here in the US. So you're a very cosmopolitan uh, person. And I'm interested, uh, when. When you went from one step to the other in this journey, so from Haiti, uh, you know, eventually university in France, from there to Mexico, from there back to Chicago, did you see where the path was going more than one step down the line? Did you know the end from the beginning, or were you just kind of following one step at a time? Oh, thank you very, very much, Matt. It is a very great pleasure to be here, and I'm so more than happy, to, again, to be sit down and have a conversation with your friends. Matt has become a friend for me. Really, really, really appreciate that. Very grateful to you. Um, I think more it's the way really I grew up and in the way I was born and this dynamic in my family, I just like let life just guide me and entrust the spirit. It's not really per se about tomorrow but rather how, what is the spirit is asking of me today so that tomorrow will be the one that's defined. I truly believe that tomorrow will be better. Therefore, I've been asking to do my best, prepare today for, to make it happen today. Pretty much that's what I do. I really don't, I did not know I, would, I was going to be in Chicago, going to be in France and Congo and Brazil and Mexico and <laughs> Spain, so on and so forth. It just come in and say very thanks to God. And here we are yeah. today. I did not know I was going to be here in Princeton <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> here we are now. I think it's more about like a sense of like trust, okay. the spirit, and believe something that tomorrow will be better. OK, that's a very important point. Let me ask you this then. Do you find that as you go through your life, you become more discerning 
of God's Spirit, that you are more attuned to what you think God wants from you, or have you always felt you had that attunement since you were young? I, I was born in a family. My mother and father was like, all of them, they are like Southern Baptist preachers. I was really pretty much born in a, in a preaching family. Again, I, as we heard this morning from Luke, this experience like of, you know, see the family that like teaching, preaching, praying, as a sense of working with the Spirit. Allow the Spirit be the one who is like moving the heart and then flowing the blood and the veins of the family. That's how. Plus, now becoming a Jesuit, the notion of discernment coming right now based rooted in the culture of my family right. just allow me to pay more attention to what is God is asking of me and what is the best way today I can respond to God. That's how I discern between the movement of now, the experience of yesterday, and the openness and trust of God's plans of what will happen tomorrow. Okay. That's pretty much how the spirit is happening. Most of the time, you will create some conflict with Ignatius, very clear about that and the principle of discernment, right? between different type of like realities, possibilities, expectations, and also a like gift, you might have that exposed in front of you. Ultimately, it's how am I open and willing to let God be the one who guide me for the last call? And where is God in the midst of all of this? Is that supposed about me, my me per se? We just like just about God. Ultimately, it's supposed to be God. And once it's God, that's why Ignatius said, you know, I pay attention to the interior movement. Where is God leading me? If it's I finally where I find peace, then I trust this peace and I follow God. So far, it's been working for me. You can try it out. <laughs> okay. It has been working for you. Thank you very much for that, Patrick. Um, now, in this uh, 2022 book, uh, The Crucible of Racism. Uh, you discuss uh, your conversion and your impetus to join the Jesuits, um, but you also discuss in some I, quite painful detail um, the racism that you encountered when you came to the United States, including from other Jesuits. And I wonder if you can briefly describe that experience for those who are here this morning. Sure, pretty much. Um, the experience of it is, is, I think, so what has been rooted in who we are, mainly like in the U.S., even, even in the world, but pretty much like in the U.S. is different. Mm -hmm. Means I was born in Haiti when I was five years old. My parents like moved to France and Montpellier. That's where I grew up and then went to school and then end up for school and all the things. Traveled pretty much many places. Yet, there is something different that's really happened. I mean, going to school in Germany, Spain, and other places, I really didn't know that I was a black man <clears throat> until I come to the US. This experience will really, like, transform me, challenge me, and bring me here, make me even like a better person. Perhaps I, sometimes I even like put that in questions mark, you know, for us like, like with the black diaspora, because myself is somehow hyphenated. We're going to talk about that further in the conversations. But part of me, I could say, you know, from this black diaspora, but the other part of me also, I like, just black from the US, because that's how my ancestors and so on and so forth. But we tend to take this for granted if you were not having this experience. Being black for us, it just, you know, just like nothing. You would not really know, I did not know I was a black man until I came to the US for graduate school. And somehow for me, it was coming back from home. I Means I fast forward, my, my, my ancestors arrived here in 1876 and they were bought in fact 
and the auctions in New Orleans, Louisiana, by one of the preacher who is here, in fact, from the Princeton plantation. Mm. For me, here today is a, somehow is a homecoming for me. Here, my great grandfather learned to read and write here in Princeton plantations. This fast forward there is one of the migration story, under, underground story that's understudied in the U.S. At least in the U.S. In the 1800s, after Haiti got their independence in 1804, then there were like all of that was happening, the movement that was happening south. If you had your wife and children, because you did not, you were in slavery, the only things you could have done is move them down to either Maryland or down at a port in Louisiana. Then the Haitian government give them a check for about the equivalent of $1,000 in land. They automatically move from slavery to middle class. There was a huge underground that was moving to Haiti. That's how fast forward in the 1800s, the 1876, that's how my parents, from here, the Princeton Plantation, one of those preachers were very, very good to my grandfather. They were a nurse. They used to travel back and forth in Haiti for doing missions trip. And that's how this preacher, with my godfather, they moved to Haiti, they paid for them, and bought the lands. That's how my parents end up in Haiti. Okay. In fact, my parents are one of the few first ones to brought Southern Baptists to Haiti, to the island. Okay. That's how I end up in Haiti. Yet, coming back here in the US, still today, I have part of my family who is still living here in New, New Jersey. The same from here, from those family. The experience was like still to the, whenever you engage in this experience, you're having this sense of like, where do you come from? Go back where you're from because you're not from here. But first, when you talk about here, which place? Where are you seeing and who is what? That's what really engage in this like complex history, if you will. Yeah. And that's part of me. This is why earlier I told you like I have this like high affinity experience as a human being. Diaspora, yet still part of this, but sometimes I'm just like this black, but sometimes I'm just like nothing. Hmm. I'm just not even considered as a human simply because I'm black. I think that's where we are and that's what brings us here today. That's pretty much what I try to explain in the crucible of racism, which somehow I think is one of the experience of each one of us as American and this land. Okay, thank you for that. Um, let me ask you one more question from that book, The Crucible of Racism. Then we'll turn to the other book on the spiritual exercises. Um, you, you, you gave one insight there I found especially powerful uh, in that book. Um, and I wonder whether you'd comment on it. Here's what you write, quoting you here from the book. Um, page 53, actually, I can do that from right here. Um, to be black in America means to find yourself in a position where you have to justify yourself in order to exist. Ironically, through this painful undertaking, the Jesuits taught me to recognize and claim my black identity. Today, I consider this to be the deepest spiritual experience I have ever had, full of grace and challenges. Yes, that's a, thank you very, very much. That's a very great experience because, again, your existence in itself as a human is being based on these constant daily justifications. <laughs> I have to tell you twice, I'm a human like you. Just like James Baldwin said, if you could even open your eyes to see under the curtain of my skin, perhaps you will be able to touch my humanity. Hmm. I think this is this blindness that we engage with here in, the, in this part of the world, where we're constantly blind. 
In fact, what we've been create and recreate, if you will, based on fear or other stuff, I don't know, about we only see this external aspect. But can you see the person, the human being, as someone who exists, who is fully, have full senses, just like you and me, beyond this one? Or can you even love me with that one? That's the big questions here we have to understand. And the, the other part of this, of this question also from here, the, the crucible of a, a, a racism, as I said earlier, I don't know if I did not come back home to the US. I don't know if I would be able even like to reach this level where I finally truly understand and get to know myself as I am today through this deep sense of suffering that just like you know earlier when Luke was singing like read in the water. You know, the, the song is full of meaning because you, whenever you're reading the water with all of this pain and suffering experience, like people who are like denying your humanity, your even minimum self of existence, yet there is a sense of hope. How God troubled the water and brings some things out of nothing. I think it's be, from this sense of like denying me not being a human is that finally remind me I was so privileged and never pay attention to the gift of my blackness mm. until I have to go through this fire and born again. Mm. And this is where we are. Okay, very good. Thank you. Let's turn now to uh, your book, The Spiritual Work of Racial Justice. I, I've purchased copies of this book for several of my friends, and I loaned the copy to another friend who never gave it back. So I went looking for it before I came out here, and it's gone. <laughs> so I'm going to quote, though, from my notes on that, on the book. I, I recommend it to everybody. Uh, it's wonderful. My first question really is um, uh, how you thought to engage the Ignatian exercises in relation to questions of racial justice. It's a, it's a very... Um, it's a very compelling way that you make that connection. How did this uh, inspiration come to you in the first place? You know, the often, thank you very much, Matt. That oftentimes is a challenging question, right? <laughs> um, we often come about these, these expressions like all research or me search. I think that's <laughs> how pretty much I come to it. Okay. I was like struggling myself even to pray. And, you know, I'm a black man, pretty much in a white space mm -hmm. where everything you see is white, mm -hmm. including the way you've been praying is truly, like, deeply, like, this sense of, like, whiteness that doesn't allow any, uh, give you any space, including to breathe. And somehow, spiritually, I was, like, struggling to this sense of, like, this kind of, like, a spiritual, like, as fictions. Mm where I couldn't breathe spiritually. I had to pray and find, ask God for a grace to lead me. And somehow the spiritual works has become pretty much the food of my own prayers and openness to God. See, give me some things. I need some things here because I cannot. First of all, I was, I often say that I, this book I started the books about like six months before I had the full other manuscript. I wanted to create a conversation between James Baldwin. By the way, I still have, I'm yet to finish this book. I wanted to create a conversation between James Baldwin, Franz Fano, and St. Ignatius. Hmm. I wanted to intersect them, have this conversation, okay, what is the experience here in America? And then have some things I kind of like heady. Yeah because that's what, the way I get my comfort, means I've done it before, <laughs> I like it, and I think it's good. And I had this book pretty much, I was just like in the last step of like reviewing and other stuff, and things that I did not sign the contract yet with the publisher. And after an experience that happened in my community, 
from the, uh, with where I was living with my brothers, uh, Jesuit brothers. Around like three in the morning each, I found myself, as I was like looking, reviewing the manuscript, I found myself just like in tears, dropping. I just get the manuscript up, just I drop everything else and put it on the trash. Mm. And praying over, and I realized that within six, months, six weeks, that's what Ignatius wanted me to do. Mm. That this book Ignatius wanted him to write and state of having this conversation between James Baldwin and Franz Fano and Ignatius. This is this book of prayer and meditation that Ignatius himself invited me to do something different with. And ever since, he took me like really like about six weeks to do it, but not only that, it's how finally I found a spiritual avenue where I can come to do myself. But the resource in itself invite people not only like to know to pray, but to look ourselves in the mirror of human beings and engage in this spiritual conversation with Ignatius. Who would God want me to be? And ask these questions, how we can be human together, but differently. Hmm. That's where this notion of like the spiritual exercise is really like come invite us. And that's how this book really come encounter us where we are. It's how we can be human again. Because more than ever, we, we've never, we've never found ourselves where we are today since civil war in this country. And we have to ask ourselves, what is happening? The second aspect of the, the spiritual exercises also you'll find in this book, and Ignatius of Loyola and himself, I think is one of the experiences that really intersect of our time today. It's because Ignatius of Loyola had to go through his pen. Because fast forward, just like this 16th century saint, Catholic man from Basque country, now Spain, he was like in this war battle, and then his, his chief, his, the governor, said to him, do not go back on the mountain. We have to surrender because most of our men die. We have no munitions and so on and so forth. But Ignatius was so stubborn. This is why we see today most of those Jesuits, they are very, very stubborn. <laughs> Starting with me. He was so stubborn, he said, no, I have to go. The commander said, no, we cannot because most of our men die. Ignatius said, no, I will go. He took a couple of men with him. He just go to the mountain. To... Fast forward, when the French was moving down, they were way, way, way superior in numbers and munitions than them. They keep shooting, pretty much kill everything. And Ignatius of Loyola received a bullet on his leg. Right here in the mountain of Pamplona, lay down. When the Frenchmen came, they see him, because he was a noble man, he was also like chief of his troop. They carry him home, and the rest of them surrender. The pain of this like, leg, later on, that's bringing suffering. And somehow, that's out of which were born the spiritual exercises. This is why the spiritual exercises in themselves they are like a result of pain and suffering of a human being who is completely like confused, lost, and depressed, yet, yet was about to see some things beyond everything else, which is possibility. That's where we are today. Okay, that's very powerful. That's really, really compelling. Thank you for that. Um, you say something in that book that I think it's important people to understand. Um, you write this. You write that the spiritual exercises are not structured like a story. They are much more like a reading a car manual. They are a how-to set of directions for drawing close to God so that we can be free to see our lives differently 
and make a difference in the world around us. Now, in the book, you structure these exercises. It's a 30-day program you give us, and there are four weeks, then a couple days at the end. And the four weeks, you, these are the topics here. Um, the, week one is on the sin of division. Week two, uh, Christ as a person of color. Week three, the crucifixion and the suffering of people of color. And week four, resurrection and the power of possibility. Let me ask you if we have time questions about each of these four weeks. In that first week, week one, the sin of division, um, you make a really important uh, comment there, uh, observations about the uh, reality and the impact and the elusiveness of structural racism. Um, it's all around us, but uh, a lot of people, white people especially, don't see these structural features of racist society. And you point this out, I'm quoting you here, surveys conducted by the Public Religion Research Institute found that white Christians, including evangelical Protestants, mainline Protestants, and Catholics, are almost twice as likely as whites without a religious affiliation to say police violence against blacks are isolated incidents rather than evidence of a pattern. Why, that's, that's fascinating and really, to me, disturbing. Why is it that white Christians in particular have a difficult time getting their minds around structural racism? The issue from this, thank you very, very much, Matt. It's always a very tough question, so I, I worry That's why I'm that. here. That's <laughs> and he's very good at that. The issue here, number one, I think for us, the way we are engaged with Christianity here in America, it just somehow make it, we want Christianity to become a blanket of comfort, not to challenge us. We all go to church as a way, let's say like you see, for example, right now we're on the East Coast. We know what does that mean to be cold. And we know whenever between the reality outside and inside. For us, outside is very, very cold, then let me go to church. We somehow become, a, America somehow, for us, Christianity in America becomes somehow a never, never land. We all want to be comfortable in our own like innocence. We use Christianity to play a game of innocence mm. so that we can deny the reality. Mm. Just like James Baldwin said, you know, deny is one of the biggest, deepest like, sins of America. And secondly, we become, you see how in the church, we every Sunday, every day we are, we are preaching about like, we need to move from our idol, stop worshiping idol. Yet, for us, whiteness, it's one of the strongest idols we're worshiping in the, in, the Christian, in the Christian church in America. This is why whoever is not white is away from us. You, after all that happened, right in the 60s, we see that happen against in the 92 in Los Angeles, and then Ferguson happened, Florida happened, we know, and 2000 happened. We all of us say, you know, okay, now we are done. What is happening just yesterday in Memphis? Mm -hmm. These notions of like, for us, worshiping whiteness, number one, our worship, number two, is becoming blind for us. We cannot see the true reality the human reality, which is a Christian reality. If you cannot see human, how come you want to see me, you can see Christ? <laughs> if you cannot see me as human, then what about the gift of like, the incarnation? God, this is why he was an incarnate and human being. Christ is a human just like me, like you. This is this double standard we play in Christianity. We are all seeking for comfort. This is why our churches are full, but all of them become empty. Mm. Empty of Christians. That's how the sense of divisions divide us from the call that God has sent us, which is to be human for each other. 
We move from being human for each other and being like zombie within the church for all of us. <laughs> okay, uh, that's a powerful thought. Uh, and one that is um, really uh, causes a lot of reflection in me, I'm sure in a lot of us, about what our faith means to us. Is it just a place to seek comfort or to confront the most painful uh, realities about our condition? I don't know. We all of us want, we all of us want to go to heaven, but nobody wants to go <laughs> to, to the other way. I don't want to say it. By the way, I'm, 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 I have a book coming out on death. I have a good friend of mine. She can say, talk about everything, but don't talk about death. <laughs> this is why I don't want to mention death, because I know some people here don't want to get in trouble. But hey, all of us want to go to heaven, but who is going to die? Just like say Mireille Mathieu. Is that what is happening? Today, this is what I talk also on the crucible of racism. Our Christian life is a crucible, and again, See the gift of incarnation, Christ, God made human through Christ. And Christ himself go through it. He, we understand we have to pray for this gift to go to see beyond the cross. We are not gonna stay on the cross, but we cannot skip the cross either. Right. And this is where like the gospel like was so important. This is what the gift of black spirituality is so important. This is why Ignatian spirituality is matter today. It invite us to engage in this reality. We have to move away from this notion of being so comfortable in the church. Every single day we go to church, all are welcome, all are welcome in God's name. We are very happy to sing that give people who looks like us very good hug. You looks good. Guys love you. Yet, how many of those people belong in our church? Being welcome yet not belongs. What does that mean to the body of Christ? The sin of racism that divide us, in fact, in today, is becoming true wounds in the body of Christ. Christ's body is bleeding of the sin of racism. And we, all of us, we hide within the church in our comfort, blind from our wide gaze, pretend we don't see it. That is such a great paradox. All are welcome, but few belong. That is um, really profound. Um, there are so many questions I want to ask you. We're going to week two, all right? We just, just you know, okay, right. Because I do want to leave time also for questions from those out here. Week two, which is, this is about Christ as a person of color. One of the things you do, if you remember this, if not, we can go to another question, but you give a, a provocative, like a powerful reading of Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan, right? Um, and your mark uh, is quoting you that it helps you better understand the way many whites define racism versus the way people of color define racism. Can you walk us through that interpretation of Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan? Sure. sure. So I think, oh, sorry about that. That's part of technology right there. <laughs> That's even a better Samaritan technology of today. Um, I think one of the things here, I hopefully means I pretty much like all of you like familiar with the story in the Bible, right? The Good Samaritan. See how she was like working in and engaged in these conversations. But when Christ came, first of all, the other guys came in to engage, right? Each one of them want to accuse one another. That's what we are very, very good at, accusing one another, but denying also the reality. Here, we can see something very, very important. What did Jesus, what did Jesus did when he met the lady? That's the very, very first question I, I think we need first to engage and ask. What did Jesus did? when you meet the lady. 
And today in America, when we are engaged, we are working on our path, we are working on our side. With what do we do? First, for the same questions here, Matt. For us Jesuit and our formations, we have to do one thing we call like a pilgrimage. It's that something's way back. Ignatius, you know, the Jesuit are very, very strict on the tradition for formation. When I was doing my pilgrimage, the superior of the house gave you $35 in one way bus ticket. They kick you out for 30 days. You write about that in here, don't you? Yes. Yes, yeah. Yes. You're on your own. Yeah. <laughs> and fast forward, I get my $35, one with bus ticket. There is this black man with one shirt and one pants in the back part of my suite on my back. I don't, you don't know where we're going to sleep. We don't know what we're going to eat. But by the way, let me tell you that this is one of the best time in my Jesuit life ever. <laughs> Get vacation for 30 days. <laughs> <laughs> but beside my vacation, I was in Jacksonville, Florida. And I spent most of this time hanging out with homeless people and sleeping in homeless shelters and just talking with half friends. There is this guy I met on the, on the park, and we were like talking and so on and so forth, but I was hungry. I needed food. It was lunch. I did not get breakfast. I think the day before, I get a very, very few things to eat. But my friend, we, by, by this time, we were about day three or day four. I don't remember exactly. Then we come right now. Each time we go to lunch together and then have dinner together, we become friends. I became friends with these homeless guys. This day, he said, okay, you know what, now Frank, it's time to go for lunch. Lunch was a couple of blocks away, but he told me that they have different shelters where we, can, we could go to eat. He said, today we have to go in a different one. I said, but I don't know it. He said, hey, bro, you need to go, go that way. You're gonna get it. I'm not gonna go with you today. Be on your own. There is this guy right now who's trying to make me an adult. <laughs> Effectively, I tried to go. As I was walking, going over, and I saw these women coming, and I said, I said to, I was, I'm going to ask her, okay, where is the shelter? Because I'm just looking for the shelter where I can get some food. I'm hungry. I need help. She was coming. She said, no, hey, don't come to me. Don't come to me. I'm going to call the police. You're trying to get my purse. I said, no, ma'am, I'm hungry. I just want to ask you questions. I'm going to call the police right now. And effectively, she get her cell phone, she called the police. Mm. And I had to run. I forget if I was hungry. I think that my adrenaline get activated. I just had run back, go back to the shelter. I bring this story here is mainly to try to explain ourselves, to ask ourselves on this same, same talking with the Samaritan women. When, you, when we see someone like that in the street, who do we see? And how do we want to be remembered? What about Jesus, who sees the Samaritan? Are you going to want to accuse them already before we even get to know what is happening of their life and their own experiences? Who do we want to be remembered? How do we want to be remembered and who do we see in each other? That's a very, very simple question. I know Matt already asked me this question about this, this Samaritan woman. I often give a different token into it. But for me today, that's where I come with our experiences of engaging of this sense of like otherness. Mm. And in the second week, where I point this I point the story of the Samaritan woman and of the exercises, it's really like where Ignatius really like challenged us to ask us these questions: Who God want me to be, and where God want to lead me? And how God wants to reveal himself to me. Many of you probably hear like in your theology, you know about like this part of like the theology of like the revelations. 
I think this event here today is more, more than ever very important. How do we let ourselves be revealed to others, and how do we want God to be revealed to us, and from who and to who? That's the questions here I think we can navigate with. Okay. A big Terrific. Thank you so much. The third week is on uh, the crucifixion, the suffering of people of color. I'm just going to sort of mention a couple of things that you talk about there in that, in that week and ask you a question or two about week four, and then we'll give time to people here to ask some questions. You write this, um, uh, that in this third week, what you're asking us to do is to sit with, to ponder Christ's suffering on the cross uh, and to extend uh, that suffering to people of color who experience racial injustice. Um, and I really appreciate this passage that you write, you write this in that week. We have sometimes limited our understanding of the cross to each person's individual relationship with God. But scripture makes clear that the cross was not only for our individual healing and spiritual salvation, it also had another goal, the bringing together of people who had been separated by ethnic divisions. This is not secondary or incidental to our personal salvation. It's part and parcel of the healing work of the crucifixion. In Jesus' supreme act of self-giving on the cross, he demolished the barriers that separated people. Such a profound idea. That's, thank you very much, Matt. Because I, one of the questions I often bring here in this part of the third week, mainly in our context today, I even ask, what about today our challenge, working with all of that going on? What about if that was an opportunity for us to come together finally as one nation? How would that look like? Looks of the story of like the cross. Did you see Mary, the mother of Jesus, said, you know, I, and this future exercise is Ignatius said, Mary simply asked us, just come be with me. That's all he asked. And we could see, like, imagine right now, as you, I don't know which tell, which story you have of the passion of the third week, but you see all of those people that was in the crowd. Now, I don't want to judge your intentions, but at least, do I see myself in the crowd? Because the course is not only, the course is not simply kind of like kind of, gonna come as something to divide us. But can the course also be a way for us to come together? Mm-hmm. That's the questions here we've been asking. But because the notion, on the question of justice, we cannot really find justice until we have to come to redefine what is unity. There cannot be justice until when we reconfigure it, we analyze the sense of togetherness. We have to pledge to be one nation against under God. Because there is what happened here. Racism, and somehow, if you find this on these spiritual exercises, racism is not only based on the external aspect of what you can only see, like the skin color, we can see externally. But there is something deeper than that. Racism comes also as a belief. (laughs) Our forefathers... They really know what they were doing. You see, when they go say like, we the people, and the very first constitution that was like from the 1776, when they say we the people, trust me, it was never like people of color or women, from Article 1 to 49 hmm. and the constitutions. That means it's not just like something that you can see externally with our eyes, but also it's a belief. This is where Ignatian spirituality comes very, very handy, very important. Because 
Ignatius like, has many, many tools. This is why I invited you know, to pray with your senses. Yeah. Number one, it's how he invites you to meditate. Meditation, which is pretty much a change of mind. Then, number two, it's contemplate. We play our senses, our passion, and our imaginations. Today, as we are so divided, perhaps it's a unique opportunity for us to come together at the feet of the cause as one nation to allow the passion of Christ become the passion of America and allow us to follow our dear, beautiful America on her way to the passion. As we sing, oh, beautiful America, perhaps it's now it's time to just follow her on her way to the passion, but together, together, that's when finally we will allow us to bear it. All that split us apart, all our sense of like otherness, all our blindness, and all of our belief, those beliefs is what we pass on generation to the generation. Yeah. How come in the world that something that happened way 16, 15, 1700, but still alive today. Yeah. It's because it's become a belief in a culture. And this culture also is becoming gods, many little gods for us, Christian and the church, and we worship otherness. That's what divided us. Perhaps today is time we are invited to just like follow America on her way to the passions and allow us to suffer together with her so that we can see her on the other side. Thank you. Let me ask you one more question, and then we'll open to the questions here from people uh, who are here in the workshop. Um, the idea that belief uh, is sort of passed down, right? That, 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 that race is a belief and belief is passed down. You, Mentioned in the fourth week of meditations um, about the resurrection, the power of possibility, something else that's passed down, that's a painful passage, and that is the effects of intergenerational trauma. Right? And I'm, I'm, I'm going to quote you here. Uh, this is you from that week. Quote, people of color carry the negative legacy of the past. Researchers are finding that intergenerational trauma is a reality. Black babies have significantly higher levels of stress hormones than white babies. Their bodies already bear the weight of racial injustice. Now, I believe as a Christian in a literal resurrection and bodies made perfect, but I'm wondering what transformation for intergenerationally traumatized bodies can look like in the world as we presently inhabit it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think, Matt, you just, you just press a different button than me. I don't want to be too academic today. Um, the sense of like epigenesis, in fact, that's somehow my, my second job is pretty much like being a nerd in the lab. I spend time just like studying. I work a lot in like epigenesis, which is like we study like how trauma passed from one generation to the next. These are like Late on this last 10 years, epigenesis has become going, going up very, very fast. We have proven and shown how we like trauma that really happened in the 1800s still women are present in the black, indigenous, and brown bodies today. It's not a telltale, it's a reality scientifically proven. Yeah. Spiritually, we believe in the transformations. But systemically, we have also to recognize the existence of those roots that was there. I Means fast forward, let's say like systemically, we are engaged in this conversation. We understand pretty much what happened with the 
with the emancipations. Technically, those black people were not never emancipated, emancipated per se. Right. When Lincoln engaged in this conversation, in at three in the morning, at three at the afternoon, Lincoln was very, very, very mad because he did not want to sign the emancipation per se, because that was affecting all of these land owners. Yet he was forced to do it. Then fast forward what happened, this is where like Kelly Douglas ground, uh, Kelly Douglas talk about like stand your ground. That's how the police has changed the costume. They become slave patrol to police. Anyone who were not on land in a mule, you are a vacant body, then they're gonna put you to prison. That's how the prison system was born. Now, what, do, what are we gonna do with all of those bodies that was like being beaten, treated and raped by the slave owners and the plantations? You transfer them on the other side, you say, you're emancipated, but you have nothing because not having land back then was a crime. Still today, not having any the crime. See all of those homeless we have today. Now we understand where all of those things. Fast forward, once you take all of those bodies, you put them like free like that, then you put them in prison. Those trauma can uh, simmer within the gene. The gene right now get affected by all of those treatment you give them externally get indexed within the DNA. The DNA did not get big modification, yet the gene within the DNA will pass down. That's how we talk about those intergenerational trauma. This is how scientifically today it's been proven. Those people who suffered the 18, all of those treatment in the 1800 passed today. Now we understand the transformation, the spiritual transformation. But again, so I'm going to ask the same questions. How much do we spend time to pray for those people? When was the last time your preacher invited you to pray for spiritual transformation of our people of color? That's the questions. We, we truly believe in the transformation, yet we have to pray for that. If you pray, that's when you're going to recognize it then you better not even mention it. The more we ignore it, that's more the issue we're going to see. Because deny, it's one of the major sin and characteristic of racism. And denying also is one of the things that become part of us in the Christian church today. And we're being very, very comfort comfortable with it. This is why it's important to engage in this experience. We pray for our brothers and sisters because once we pray, we truly believe that God will transform and change the reality. I often say that I don't know how my other brothers who working on, who engage in this type of work, they are doing it without this spiritual lens. Prayer, it's one in primary and fundamental way to engage in this work of justice. Without prayer, there cannot be justice. Because this is not your work, man. This is not my work. This is God's work. The sins of racism, division, is even older than America. This sense has become like since 1441. And here we are today. Yet we receive this gift, these invitations to be here today. Let's do it as God wants us to do it. This is where in the fourth week of the exercise is that where Ignatius invite us to thinking with the church is to balance these nuances in human existence. Earlier I mentioned about our forefathers, right? We truly know that all that they had done, Jefferson like, I mean, it's like 15 
of our first U.S. president owned slaves. They get slave children. But we truly understand that. Yet, they did some good stuff. That's why it's become tricky. How do we balance this? Fourth week, Ignatius invite us. Thinking with the church. How can I really engage in Jefferson with all of his slave, beaten women, yet it's all that he did for America? It's very, very tricky. Ignatius very, very invite us to engage here. This is why Ignatius said, you know why? The sin and the fourth of the exercises, this our sin. In this context, we take a sin of racism, which is one of the original sins of our dear, beautiful mother of America. Our sin, Ignatius said, is a treasure, is a gift, is important. Our sin becomes the flip side of our gift. And our gift becomes the reverse side of our sin. Ignatius said they are very, very close. How can we navigate those two together as human? Just have to be aware and remember. Awareness is very, very, very important in Ignatian spirituality. We be aware of the existence of those around us. We be aware of ourselves. Broken, yet loved by God. Let's make this sense of love bring us where we are. Let's allow this sense of love connect us to the truly what is the plan of God for us, which is to live with truly, fully hope for who we are. Despite everything that happened to us, despite our brokenness, our sense of otherness, our blindness, despite the way we choose to worship this God, the God of whiteness, despite of the confusion we have, we don't know how to navigate our gift and our sin. But there is something stronger, something better, is the hope of the resurrection. Despite everything, we all know that we are not only disasters, but we are also miracle. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. In about five, maybe eight minutes, he's going to lead us in a, a meditation. Um, in the meantime, are there questions for Patrick? I've got the microphone right here. I'll bring to any who want to ask a question or make a comment. then I will thank you for the opportunity to sit here and talk with you in this format. And I'll go sit back there, turn my microphone off as you guide us in meditation. Thank you very, very much, though. Okay, now I'm going to invite you to grab a position where you feel very comfortable with yourself. Allow your feet to be on the ground. If you have something on your hands, if you feel comfortable, you can put it aside. Also, I often invite people, if you have something on your head now, you're thinking about some things, perhaps it might be the time right now to put it aside. Just allow yourself to be here and now. First, let's do a quick just breathing exercise that I call like praying with your fingers. Just see my fingers here. I have five fingers. I'm going to just try to breathe a little bit just to allow the spirit to be here. Just like that. Everybody, if you can just hold like that. Your left hand like that. Right here. This is my right hand. And I'm going to bring my right hand here. I'm going to breathe in. When I breathe in, from my belly, go, okay, but I breathe in, 
in my nose, I close my mouth, and I'm gonna breathe out to my mouth. Okay, again. But as I breathe in, I'm gonna breathe in, I go up in, and I pause and down. I'm gonna go up here. When I go up, I in, down. I'm gonna go up here and down again. This I call this the fingers examine. The fingers examine is some things I created and I come up with it while I was in my own retreat. The examine usually is five steps. Ignatius invite us to engage with God. And we happen, guess what? We happen to have five fingers. Perfect. God knows what he was doing this time. He did not forget us. For finally, no, God's always good to us. Then each one of those fingers, there are one place on the exam where Ignatius invite us to be with God. Once I go up, I pray. Now I'm going to invite you, the first step, to think about the grace you would like to bring here, something you want to pray for, you want to ask God for. As all we have heard this morning and now in this workshop, bring about the grace now. Just think about it. Once we are ready, we find a grace. Now I'm going to invite you right now. Bring your grace in. Then we're going to ask God to be here with us. Okay? Let's go slowly, deeply. Feel comfortable with yourself. Then we're going to breathe in. Ask God be here with us. Come by here. Come by here, Lord. Come by here. And then allow yourself to be in God's presence. As we breathe deeply in, we're going to go up very deeply. Breathe with me and then go in your fingers together. Slowly. Just pause. Hold on. Hold on, and we breathe out. Pause. Now on the second step. God, what do you want to do with me? What do you want to do with your land? And who do you want me to be? How do you want me to be remembered by others? We have been staying in our cocoon of comfortable. We all become Christian zombie in God church as we forget others. Allow the Spirit right now to be with us. As we breathe in, breathe, breathe in again, we go together of. Suppose. Slowly down. Now we know that God help us to remember and he is with us. Now review your day, maybe your week. 
Maybe the year. Maybe your entire life. Sin, by definitions, it means when you miss the mark. Maybe yesterday, maybe this week, maybe this month. In terms of relationships, seeing others as human, in terms of connections and sense of togetherness, where and when have I missed the mark? Where and when have I missed to communicate? Where and when have I missed to recognize Christ and the face of the other? Think about this. When was the last time I go to church? I feel very comfortable to welcome everyone, yet no one was belongs in my life. At church, I become a zombie because I'm fully integrated in the club of orderness. Allow Christ to give us the grace of transformation to make us whole and human as you want. Now we breathe in again together. Slowly down. Now, God, you give me grace to move away. Now allow me to see you, to recognize you. Give me the gift of discernment to learn how to challenge, to allow myself to be touched by nuance of human existence. Allow me to see others for who they are and come by here. Be with me. We breathe in again. We breathe in deeply. Slowly down. The fourth week of the exercise is about transformations. We die, but we allow ourselves to be transformed. See possibility and see God in everyone. It's a gift of where we truly believe that tomorrow will be better. Now let us ask God for the grace as we work together with America on her passions. We can be with America on her glory of resurrections. Because he gives us the grace and love to say, you know what? We'll always be with people and will always be with me. Enjoy and glory. Allow God to give us and invite us to engage in the grace of possibility. Where hope, joy, love is possible as one nation under God. Let's breathe in again. Pause. Slowly out. by here, my Lord, come by here, come by here, my Lord, come by here, come by here, my Lord, 
come by here. Oh, Lord, come by here. Please stand up. Heal our country, my Lord. Heal our country. Sing with me. Heal our country, my Lord. Heal our country. Heal our country, my Lord. Heal our country. Oh, Lord. Heal our country. Bring us together. Bring us together, my Lord. Bring us together. Bring us together, my Lord. Bring us together. Bring us together, my Lord. Bring us together. Oh, Lord, bring us together. Thank you. I think I said that earlier, my parents, like, I was born in a family, unfortunately, unfortunately, whatever, your chance, you could either become a preacher and very involved in the government, become a police officer or maybe like captain in the army. You become a, maybe like a health worker, doctor, MD, and some things always in the government. My grandfather was Vietnam captain in the army and so on and so forth. My great grand grandfather in fact, in the 1950s, went to Haiti, was in the U.S. Army. He went to Haiti, was like when U.S. against invaded Haiti for the second time. That's when my whole family is covered like this trouble, covered, like all over, right? Still today, I have cousins, I have other families who still like involved like in police and army. We truly understand. The way the conversation right now is going on in the country is unfortunately, whenever we think about like systemic racism, first of all, people tend to point fingers as the police institutions, which sometimes is unfair, to be honest, because not all of those police, they are kind of like, you know, they are unjust. However, we truly understand, as Elizabeth Walkerson like say that very, very clearly and cast, in fact, the training somehow in the academy they have received injury. It's somehow very, very troublesome. This is why whoever becomes a police officer automatically find themselves on the other side, say, you know, I, I know people are going to point finger at me. I'm one of the members of the system. Therefore, I have to react as a way to protect myself. One thing I often say, number one, again, myself, the way I engage as a Jesuit, the way I engage in this work, it's from the spiritual lens. Ignatian spirituality, really, the good things about it, I'm so sorry, I'm biased because I'm a Jesuit. It's always good about Ignatian spirituality, right? <laughs> the good things about it is not a reactive spirituality. It doesn't really react to instances like that. I think number one, your uncle as a sheriff, really find a way to engage him in this conversation. In other words, try to find a way of his way and go that way. Always go to their door and then invite them to come to our door. That's the Ignatian pedagogy right there, 101. Go to your uncle's door, find a way exactly to come to invite him to this hour door. Do not react with other people in other way of the conversations. We're not trying to convert people. 
somehow, right? Again, this is a system. Our work, our obligation today is to get in the system if we want to change it. We cannot stay out. Again, I earlier I mentioned that myself, as a black man, I did not know really like I was a black man until when I came here, but then I realized that I'm a black man. Being black in America, I'm telling you, is not a is not a Christmas gift. Like James Baldwin said, you know, he wasn't a when he was in a debate with Berkeley in 1964, he said, you know what? I, I guarantee you, you can want to be everything that you want, but less being a black man. We never want to be a black man. No one wants to be black in this country, as I speak to you right now, trust me. That means you already know that in the system where you are, the way the system has been shaped. Then once I realized that what I had choices, though my family is here, I'm pretty much here, I could have go back to France, I could have go back to Mexico, to Spain, I've been living in any other countries, I would be very, more than happy. Yet, for me in different ways, to do something substantial was to stay in the system and contribute. Number one. Number two is invite him to remain and stay here with his uncle. Don't move away from his uncle. Number three is really, you know, invite him. I'm going to repeat this again to engage with this, with nuances. We are human. And more than ever, we've never had this crisis. And somehow I often say that today in America, each individual, we become like people who are working and function from our frontal cortex. You say victim of trauma, I'm so sorry, I don't want to trigger anyone here. Anyone who's victim of trauma, the world has become only black and white. Those part of the brain, you, they, don't, they cannot really like work to them simply because the amygdala is moving so fast, it doesn't give you time to move, to work from the hemisphere left and right. You only like the black and white, the frontal cortex, the way he only challenge you, tell you to think, is only like, this is black, this is white. But could there a gray area here? Why do I have to engage in a system that's the only way? Do you know how we define the notion of success in America? Is anyone knows? Anyone knows? Whenever you see someone, how you get success? You have to be white. The simple notion of success means white. But cannot is there is a way I might not be white, yet I'm successful, and I fulfill the American dream? The American dream is always like this melting pot. You have to melt on the pot so that you can, you can fulfill the dream. What about the gray area? This is how, when it's become the notion of like human and racist, all of us in America, we just like function, function from a frontal cortex. White, you fulfill the dream. Not white, you're outside. You have to melt in this. Again, that's, this notion of this gray area is again from the fourth week of the exercises. Living with tension. How we can live with tensions? That's one of the things can invite him here to balance. Navigate this gray area where life also can be living right here. It doesn't, have to, it doesn't have to be that way. Why is it always have to be like a zero-sum game? The only way for you to succeed is I have... No. This is why we are human. 
Life, after all, is not black, is not white. God, after all, is not white, is not black. God exists right here. I think that's what I would invite him to navigate against the gift of discernment. When you discern all of the gifts God give you, at the end of the day, God said, you know what, my son, my daughter, you're going to have to be in the middle and make it happen. This is where, ultimately, we need to pray. There cannot be justice, there cannot be love, there cannot be hope without prayer. The work of healing, it's a work of prayer. And praying with your senses, it's allow our eyes, our ear, our mouth, everything we see, we touch, we, become, we want to become, make it a prayer. What about seeing the other would be my prayer? How would that be? Now, watch out with your eyes. Do you want to see the other with like, you want to criticize them? You want to smell the other? You want to like, make judgment with the smell? You want to hear the others? You want to just like, bring your conclusions? Allow ourselves to be this interaction with one another. Our interaction becomes a prayer. As I see you, as I talk to you, and I remind myself, I am praying. 